that we have learned from the text we've read today, and we pray that you will help us to apply them properly to our lives in Jesus' name. Some of these things are easier said and done than done. But as we look carefully through, we put out the positive traits that we need to pick up and the negative traits that I need to purge from our lives, you will do so in Jesus' name. Lord, we know that you are here even before we go here. And we know that you have been faithful unto us. And we know that you'll be faithful today, that your word will benefit us in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. So welcome to the service once more. And uh, we want to look through the text that we have read today and get some more lessons by the grace of God. Praise the Lord. Um, so uh, in terms of um, the text, let's go through the text one more time and get some lessons. So, First Kings, chapter twenty-one, from verse one. Now, in verse one, we see the setting, and it came to pass after these things. This is the setting. After what things? After Behadad had come, and uh, God has given Israel victory, and Behadad said, "Oh, because their God is the God of the hill, the God of the field, let's do it again next year." And God still gave him victory. And then Ahab was supposed to uh, do, do, conquer Behadad. And then he said, oh, you are my brother. After this, everything. And God sent uh, judgment. Uh, so God sent uh, the prophet to him. <clears throat> and then he went home heavy. He went home sad. Now, you can see that in the last, let's look at the last verse of verse 20. And look at Ahab's disposition in the last verse, verse 43. Let's read verse chapter 20, 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 43 together, please. I would, uh, and the king of Israel went to his house, heavy and displeased, and came into Samaria. Why? Because God has rebooked him. Just because God has corrected and said, because you've let this man go, then, you know, there's going to be judgment upon you. So that's Ahab for you. So after these things, it came to pass, let's go back to chapter 21. It came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, the king of Samaria. So immediately you begin to ask, this, does this man ever learn lesson, this Ahab? You know, sad today because, you know, the, um, the message has come and it, it's going to do another thing tomorrow. And we need to begin to learn from this. You know, there are some people like that. If you're not careful, you say, no, oh, this person is so repentant, so broken, so yeah, they've learned the lesson. But the problem is that they've not learned the lesson. And people like that, they could even cry in church, they could cry at the crusade, but they've never learned the lesson. You know, something happens and they suffer because of it. Maybe they go into sin, they suffer. They say, God, I will never do this thing again. If I do it again, cut off my hand, cut off my feet, and lo and behold, all the suffering that that disobedience caused, they're going to do it again. Tell somebody that I will not be like Ahab. Play your lesson. If it, do, if it doesn't pay you, you, you did it before, it didn't pay, don't, don't do it again. Can you see? So he went to his house heavy, but after these things now, he now saw, this is not an enemy coming, this is not Ben Hadar coming. He just looked outside his window, he said, wait a minute, I see that land there. Now, his palace, by the way, I guess he will have his own garden. So this is not something that is compulsory. His palace, he's the king. He has a palace, he has his own ground, but then he's just boredom and conventions, just looking outside the window and saying, oh, this place is near to my palace. This is a vineyard. I want to make it into a garden of palace. By the way, it's not like anything functional. It's not as if the herbs that are there are what Ahab is going to eat. He's the king. But he just wants a place that he can just go and relax in the evenings. And he says, well, that place is mine. That is classic covetousness. It's like somebody who has a lot of things, just like uh, the parable of uh, Nathan to David. 
the, the, the rich man that had a lot of sheep. And then he saw another one. He said, a, a visitor came. He said, I don't, I'm not going to kill any of these my sheep. It's the sheep of the poor man that I'm going to kill. So Nahab, now in verse 2, you see innocence, some innocence in verse 2. And Nahab said unto Nabal, speak unto Nabal, saying, give me thy vineyard. This is just business. There's nothing wrong in verse 2. Give me your vineyard. It's a business proposition. That I may have it for a garden of hers, because it is near unto my house. And I will give thee for it a better vineyard. That's a good business proposition, isn't it? Or if it seems good to you, I'll give you the worth of it in money. So it's fair business proposition. Give me this, I'll give you that. There's nothing wrong in here. But in verse 3, Nehemiah said unto Ahab, the Lord forbid me that I should give the, the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. We've learned in the summary why, what informed Nehemiah's decision to say that, that God has told them earlier, they shouldn't sell the land. Besides, it is what his father has given given on, give on to him. Maybe his fathers have passed away. He wants to hold on to it. He's, you can see good qualities in Naboth here. Doesn't want to, to let, let it go. He's not convertious about that other vineyard that is better. This one that my father gave to me, I count it as better than any other fancy one you are going to give me elsewhere. And you give me the money, you give me the money, I'll, I'll, I'll spend the money. But this one will stay. This one I can pass on to my children. Because this is what our forefathers gave us when we came to the land of Canaan. So up to verse 3, there's nothing wrong here. Now, in verse from verse 4, you begin to see where the trouble lies. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word of Naboth the Jezreelite, that which Nebuchadnezzar the Jezreel has spoken unto him. For he has said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid down on his bed and turned away his face and would, not eat, would eat no bread. This is the king of uh, 10 twelfths of the land. He controls 10 twelfths of the whole tribes of Israel. You know, he's the king. He has palaces, he has lands, he has whatever he wants. He has, he's rich, but still... You see how he's acting. Turn his face to the wall, will not eat. He's acting like, you know, a child that you say you cannot have ice cream. And, uh, you know, they're, they're sulking. So that's what he was doing. He was sulking, the king. And uh, sometimes when people do that, like we've said earlier in the certain script, sometimes when people do that, when somebody sulks, maybe you have a child that sulks, or maybe you are one of the youths upstairs. I'm looking at you, you, you sulk. You see, what happens is that when people sulk, they want somebody to notice them, isn't it? When the child is stomping his feet and, you know, he's do, doing his mouth like this, they want, <laughs> they want, they want, they want somebody to I say, what is wrong with you? What is the matter with you? I know when he's doing that, come and take your food. I you know before, that food is his favorite. He will always rush down. And now he's not coming. And you go to the right and say, what's wrong with you? And he turns his face to the wall. And you know, it's just, it's just drama, isn't it? He wants me to say, do you know what is wrong with you? And that's what, how Ahab behaved. He wanted, I tell you what, Je Jezebel, to say, what is wrong with you? Yes, this is a king. He's behaving like a, a child. And lo and behold, Jezebel knows him. She came to him and said, why is that spirit so sad that that eateth no bread? And he said unto her, because I speak unto neighbor the Jezreel, and said unto him, give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it please, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give my, I will not give thee my vineyard. I said, no, it's not because it's from, it's his father's inheritance hating, just because I asked him for it. He said, no, I like something, I liked it. My soul has fallen in love with it. I wanted it and I was fair. I didn't uh, come as a king. I didn't uh, grab it from him by force. So I was fair about it. I said, this is what I'm going to give you, or this one. So what is the problem? And he said, no. So later on, we're going to look at mindset. I begin to say the type of mindset, people that have the mindset that Ahab was showing at this time, they just can't, they don't understand that I want it. I point to it, and, I, and they said, no, they said, I cannot have it. And that's the mindset of a lot of people in this country, by the way. 
you know, where they just feel that they can have anything that they want. Um, and, Je and Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, does thou not now govern the kingdom of Israel? In other words, are you still the king? Arise and eat bread, and let thy heart be merry. I will give thee. I will give it to you. I will give you that ice cream that you want. Don't worry. Mama, I said you can't have it, but me, big auntie, don't worry. I'll give you what you, what you want. And she wrote eight letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent letters to the elders of the, to, unto the elders and to the nobles that were in the city dwelling with Naboth in Jezreel. So remember Ahab, his palace was in Jezreel. He might have had many palaces all over the place, but the, his house at this time was in Jezreel. Nahab, Nabal's Virginia was in Jezreel. She sent letters to the elders of Jezreel. And she spoke, she wrote in the letters, proclaim a fast as if something has happened in the country. Some calamity has happened. This is coming from the king with the king's seal. And then set Nebot on high. So call him and say, look, it's like a trial. Bring him forward. And set two men of Delia before him, two people without principles, two wicked people, you know, that can lie on demands for a price. And let them say, we heard you blaspheme against God. We heard you say, we heard you curse God. We heard you say bad things about God and the king. And then, this is how you are going to judge it. This is still Jezebel speaking in the name of Ahab. This is how you are going to judge it. When they say that one, you are the elders. You are supposed to judge with your initiative according to the law. But this is the judgment you should take on that something. Carry him out, stone him, that he will die. Praise the Lord. I don't know people, I don't know countries of the world where people still control the, the judges and the judgment and you, the, the lawyers are there and the jury is there and the witnesses are there, but it doesn't matter. Somebody has said that that case that is coming to you, this is how you are going to judge it. And sometimes it's not just third world countries or developing, sometimes it's even in very developed nations because they're the same lodge. You understand? They're the, they're the same lodge. They're the same, you know, the, the judge and some of these other people, these big politicians, the chiefs, they're the same lodge. They're the same Masonic, you know, brotherhood. And they've told them that this is how it's going, it must happen when that case comes on to you. But it doesn't work with the child of God. Amen. The Lord will make all their plans to fail in Jesus' name. And then the men of his city, even the elders, and the nobles which inhabited of the city, these are nobles, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she sent to them. And they proclaimed the fast and sent them high among the people. And they came in two men, exactly as she said it. And sat before the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. And they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. You know, in the Old Testament, she was using Old Testament for them, even though she was not a believer. She said, she knew that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So if any, if any accusation comes, let it be confirmed. Before you take judgment and you execute people, you bring tough judgment down upon people, let there be like at least two witnesses that say, we had it. We saw it so that it's not just one person saying it. What God put in the law to safeguard against injustice is what Jezebel used, you know, to bring about injustice in the land. Then they sent to Jezebel. You say, why did they send to Jezebel and not to Ahab? Since she used Ahab's name to write the letter, they knew it was coming from her. Everybody knew. Ahab knew. The people knew. They knew it was Jezebel behind it. So when it came, they did come to Ahab to say, the letter you sent, sir. This is what we did. They went to Jezebel because they know it is her. Praise the Lord. You know, there are people like that, that um, it's the husband that has the position, but it's the wife that is ruling. And look, God forbid when that is, a, a, is a, in the church, you know, it, it may be the founder. Everyone knows this is the pastor, but it's the wife that is ruling it. It's the wife. And she will say many things in the name of her husband. She'll write letters, say many things. She's the one. That's called, if she likes you there, you'll be there. If she doesn't like you there, you will not be there. That's the, way, that's the way it is. If she wants favor to come upon you, favor will come. If she doesn't want favor to come upon you, favor will not come. There are people like that. 
and the husbands that you know maybe they are even in the marriage committee and uh, everything they don't know how to keep their mouth shut is everything they'll come back and tell their wife this is what they brought to the marriage committee this was so and so 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 or maybe the building committee or any other committee as well the wife counsels him over food that will happen she said oh no that ah, that brother cannot marry that sister ah, that sister ah, that doesn't respect me in the church ah, that brother cannot marry her. tell them to both of them to go and pray very well as she said it that's how it's going to happen i pray we will not have such in our church in jesus name so women have a very wonderful ministry, but when you begin to usurp and you begin to control like Jezebel, it's not good. The spirit of Jezebel is not the spirit of a, 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 that should be seen a Christian. So that people like, like that, they know how to influence their husband, they know how to rule, they know how to control everything. So they sent to Jezebel saying, Nehebel is stoned and is dead. Now, you're going to ask, is it Jezebel that should be, even though she's queen in, in, in title, she should be the one controlling things. These elders are Israelites. This Jezebel is not an Israelite. Ahab just went to go and bring her for somebody. But just because she's the, the leader's wife, don't let her take over everything. She doesn't know the doctrine. She doesn't know the practice. She doesn't know, she doesn't have even have respect for your God. She's serving her own God. And she's trying to spoil everything. So. Don't just let her take over the elders. What are you doing? Don't let Jezebel turn your nation into her own Zidonian kind of a, a thing. So they said to her, they said, David is stoned and is dead. Now it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Nabal was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Nabal the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. For Nebot is not alive but dead. You know, she, there's some spite in this statement in the, and in the way she acted. She said, you, in her talk, she was saying, you, you refuse my husband there. You refuse money from my husband. You refuse another loving you from my husband. Okay. Let us see what is going to happen. So see what she's saying here. She said, that which he refused to give you for money when he was alive. The man is there now. Go and take it free. You are not paying anything for it. Just go and take it free. So there's a spitefulness here from Jezebel towards the Batlat. Who, who do you think you are? We're even offering you money. You are doing, you are, you are, you are doing a, some kind of a reaction to us. Okay, let's see how it's going to end. And it came to pass when he had had, no question. That's why you know he's in cahoots with the whole thing. When he had and nobody was dead, no question, how did the Nehabot die? The man I just spoke to yesterday, we were talking about business, how did he die? He didn't actually know what we do. You know, some people like Ahab, they're saying the, the, the least, the, 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 the less I know is better for me. You know, they try to keep their hands clean. So if people say, you are the one, they say, it's not me. But they like things to happen. They just don't want to get their hands dirty. So they use, they will, they will drop the hint with you. You go and do the, what they want you to do. And then at the end of the day, in the court, of, they can stand up and say, did you say, are you the one? It's not me. This thing was forged. It's not me. So there are people like that. If you're like that, please change. It's not, it's not a good type of nature. It's not a good type of character. Where you, 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 you want things to happen. You, try, you make them happen and in a sneaky kind of way. So... Ahab, Nebot heard that uh, Ahab that Nebot was dead. Immediately he just arose. He took possession of the vineyard. Truly, without money, without even buying it. As, like a, as, his wife, as if his wife gave him a present, bought with the blood of Nebot. That's how it is. And the word of God came to Elisha the Tishmite, saying, Arise, go and meet Ahab, the king of Israel, which is in, in Samaria. Behold, he's in the, in, in the vineyard of Nebot, whither he has gone down to possess. I love this part, I love, you know, how the Elijah's role here. And God told you specifically, I love that relationship. God told you, this is where the man is. He's in neighbor's vineyard. That's specific. Go and meet him. He went down to possess it. And thou shalt speak to him saying, Thus said the Lord, hast thou killed and taken possession? 
and thou shalt speak unto the king. Thus said the Lord, in the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall the dogs lick thy blood, even thy in the in the in the vineyard of Naboth, or you know in the in the gate in the gate of the city. And 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 um, and Ahab said to Elijah, "Has thou found me, O my enemy?" No. Think about that, Hazard. You did wrong. You know that there, there are people also that have that kind of nature. Amen. You know, and there are people in churches that have that kind of nature. You know how they uh, what this how they the attitude is. It could be on Sunday, or it could be when you're addressing people in workers or anything. They'll say, "This man has found me again." They have found me. Again. Is it only me they are looking for in this place? Oh, I told you that that man is my enemy. That preacher is my enemy. Has that, you found me again? Has that found me again? Oh, my enemy. And as they're coming to church, they'll tell their wife, you say, what chance? That man, he will find me, he will say something about me again. And it's because of what you are doing. If the last time uh, Elijah rebooked it, it's because of what you are doing. Now, if you don't, if you didn't do what you did now, would, uh, would God be sending Elijah to, instead of you to repent and say, look, this thing is not good change. They have this attitude that, oh, if they are found me again. Has that found me again, oh, my enemy? You are looking at me, you are persecuting me. It's like a child in a school that the teacher is correcting. All the time they say the teacher hates me. Why? Oh, they're correcting my work all the time. If the other person does work, they say it's nice. If I do work, they always call It's because your work is not good. That's why they're correcting your work. So they can prepare you for examination. And I like Elijah here. He said, I have found you because you have sold thyself to walk evil in the sight of the Lord. That's why the preaching is coming to you. That's why the message is coming to you because you did wrong. And behold, I will bring evil upon thee and I will take away thy prosperity. I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseged the were all males and him that is shut up and left in Israel, even the ones that go and hide themselves. And I'll make the house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation, for the provocation, where you provoke me to anger, to make Israel, and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, the dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. He that died of Ahab in the city shall the dogs eat, and he that died in the field shall the fowls of the eat. Look at this summary. And there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to walk wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. That's the summary of the life of Ahab. Ahab sold himself to walk wickedness in the hand of the Lord. So Ahab himself is wicked. But Jezebel took his wickedness to another level. She stirred him up. In this case now, we're of Nepal and Ahab, can you see how Jezebel stirred him up? That's Jezebel and Ahab's relationship for you. That the man is bad, the man is weak, but the wife also is the one stirring him up, take, making him take some action. He would have just sought, he would have, you know, he might not be happy, he would be, have, um, be reacting, but Jezebel took him to another level of murder. I did very abominably, in following idols. This is Ahab. Now you can't blame Jezebel for this. Uh, all these things, as with the Amorites, which the Lord, which whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass when Ahab heard this word. This is classic Ahab for you. When he had, he would do something bad, he will hear, then he rent his clothes. Why? Not because of Nehobot that died, not because he's mourning for Nehobot and say, This man has died. What are we going to do? But because of that judgment that is coming upon him, that's what Ahab reacts to. You see, there's no restitution, there's no, there's no sorrow about how can we uh, take care of the family? No, there's nothing about how can I give back the vineyard that I've took? No, it's the judgment that makes him put on sackcloth and fast and go softly because he loves himself. Praise the Lord. And the word of God came unto Elijah just by saying, seest thou how Ahab humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will bring no, I will not bring this evil on his days, but in his son's days will I bring this evil. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So you see here, there's something that uh, I don't know if you, you notice. 
um, in the search scripture, but there's something that we need to see here. So I'm going to try and pick out the, to see the accent that uh, Ahab went here. Let me try and pick this thing out for you. So if you look at, um, hold on one minute. Let me try and give you the right. It's in Second Kings. So in Second Kings, if you look at, um, I'll find a place for you, but you will see in Second Kings, something happened in Second Kings. When Jehu, was um, was commenting on what happened. You discover that it's not just it's not just Nebot actually, but even Nebot's sons. So it's not just Nebot; it's Nebot's sons as well that the this uh, action affected. So they 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 um. They, there's an implication that even when um when they killed Nebot, they also killed his sons. Because Jehu was telling them that this, what is happening to Ahab and to Jezebel is because of Nebot and his family and his sons. So, which means that maybe, because it's an issue of inheritance, they also said, let us, the sons that can challenge it, the sons that, the inheritance, the sons that you know, could come and talk in future, let us get rid of them. So I will find that reference for you later on. So you can see that it's the extent of the wickedness that they went to. So Naboth, and probably maybe Naboth's sons, and um, just for a vineyard. And as Abra said earlier, where's that vineyard today? You go to Israel, you say, where's Naboth's vineyard? That you killed somebody on because of a, a garden. You killed somebody. For... So that's the way some people don't value life at all. They don't value uh, people. So as you look at here, let's pick up some key characters here. You see Ahab, this is what somebody said. It says there are three categories of dangerous characters in this chapter. There is um, Ahab, who is weak, who is wicked and weak. That's, that's the character of Ahab. There are people who are wicked and weak. They are wicked and they're weak. They're ungodly and they're weak. And when you see people like that, uh, you need to be very concerned about them. You know, they're not born again, but they're weak. And if such people are still in a Christian community, then a lot of work needs to be done on them. So Ahab, wicked and weak. Now, Jezebel was wicked and strong. And when you see people that are wicked, and when they come across people that are wicked and strong, oh, there's an explosion that takes place. Someone that is wicked and weak, maybe he's hiding among the, uh, the group of uh, Christians, born again, uh, born into a, a, a church like this, not born again, later some hidden wickedness inside his life, that have not come out yet. And then when it's time to marry, who will he marry? Will he marry somebody that is born again? Of course not. How can God give his child to... to so they got, if they go and marry somebody that is wicked and weak like them, then that is, uh, you, you know, you might not see so much. But if the wife they go and marry is like Jezebel, wicked and strong, it is a terrible thing. The wickedness, you know, you say, I never thought this boy could do this. I never thought this girl could do this. So I pray that our children will be born again in Jesus' name. So Jezebel was wicked and strong. And the elders of Jezreel were wicked and subservient. The wicked are just subservient. Just say, yes, sir. Yes, ma. Just whatever they push up on you. If they, if they haven't said it, they might not do it. But whatever is the boss, whatever I say, we'll just do it. If they say we should kill somebody, we won't ask questions. We should just do it. And that's not right. You know, you should, you should learn to ask questions. Why are we taking this action against Nebot? Why are you saying we cannot do it? It's better to die for righteousness and to say, look, I'm not going to do it. We're judges in the land. We're not going to do this thing. Persecutors. 
take the position of judge from us, even kill us, you've killed other people, Jezebel, but we're not going to kill an Israelite, our brother, by the way, we are elders of Jezreel, and he's a man of Jezreel, to kill our brother, why? To please this strange queen that Ahab has brought in. You know that people like that, they just want to please whoever is there. I pray we'll not be like that in Jesus' name. Yeah. Wicked and subservient. But we too see righteous people also here, righteous characters. You see, you see, uh, Nebot, you see, he's righteous and he's unyielding, he's, 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 he's straight, he's righteous, he's upright, he's bold. And then you see, Elijah is righteous and is restored. This Elijah we're talking about today, as a general superintendent told us uh, last month, when we're doing the final solution on the Sunday, you see this Elijah that said, I want to die, kill me. This is Elijah that God said, no, I'll give you double food. You are going to still do some work for me. This is Elijah that was running from Jezebel before. Now he's no longer running from them. He went to go and meet Ahab there. He said this, God said, that Jezebel that I was running for that I thought is going to kill me. This is what God, go and tell your wife that she will die and the dogs will eat her body. So <laughs> Elijah is not the same, amen. This is a restore, I never think it's the end. God has more for you in Jesus' name. Now, a quick look at some mindsets here. You see Nebo's mindset, Nebo has a mindset that is always checking up. Look back into the scriptures, check up. Is it allowed for me to do this? You want me to sell this land? Is it allowed? It has a mindset of contentment. Whatever my fathers have given, is, I'm happy with it. I don't want that other bigger vineyard that you are going to give to me. This is good. It's a mindset of always looking back and looking at the Asian landmark and saying, what can, what can I change? What can I not change? What have to, we have, has been handed over down to us? And I'm happy with it. The fact that our fathers have handed it down, I'm happy. On the other hand, you look at Ahab's mindset. Ahab's mindset is a mindset that everything has a price. Everything can be negotiated. Everything, don't think about, you know, all the tradition and the history that we have and the heritage that we have here. What is good? What is, what do we need today? What, what do I need today? I need a vineyard. It, just get it. Add it on. There's nothing that cannot be changed to accommodate my, my needs. There's nothing that is set in stone. You see Jezebel's mindset, a mindset of, you know, that if you stand in, if you stand in the way, you know, uh, you get, uh, you get uh, knocked down. This, you no, know, I said that I will get it for you. I will, I will, uh, I, I, if, it, if it means killing, you know, in a murderous mindset. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. So we want to look at uh, Hebrews chapter <laughs> Hebrews chapter uh, 35. Sorry, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. So, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. So what we're looking at is a life without covetousness. Amen. He says it's possible to have a life without covetousness. Well, that's the will of God for us. Of course it is possible that we, a life where there's no covetousness at all, where we, we maintain no covetousness, no, as we're going to see, what is covetousness? So in Hebrews chapter uh, 13, verse 5, he said, let your conversation, let your lifestyle be without what? Covetousness. Let your lifestyle be without covetousness. I'll be content with such things as he have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. So let your life be without covetousness. Whatever the other person has that is not yours, don't let it bother you. Don't let it be that you must get it at all costs. Because it says, look, I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So it's almost like saying, I'm your inheritance. Like he get, was to the Levites and the, your inheritance. The other people might have land. Don't worry about it. I am with you. When, and when we meditate upon that, it brings peace into our heart. It brings a satisfaction that I may not have bags of money or bags of this and that. 
But I have cause. God is with me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. As I said, you know, uh, riches profit not in the day of wrath. When the day of, when the day of uh, danger comes, the day of accident, the day of calamity, the day of, uh, you know, assassination comes, money will not save. But righteousness delivereth from death. So I pray that the Lord will help us in Jesus' name, that will give us this life without covetousness in Jesus' name. So let's look at a few things about covetousness. What is covetousness? Covetousness is a strong, sometimes irresistible desire of possessing or increasing one's possessions. So that desire that I must have, I must have. And if I have, I must get more. That is covetousness. And you begin to ask yourself, a Christian circle, sometimes it's pushed, you know, it's accepted, you know, that you, everyone, you know, you must go and get this, you must go and get that, what are you looking for? And there's always like, as the Proverbs will say, it's like running after wind, running after that thing that money has wings and it's flying away. And you're just, it's money that you are chasing after. You know, it's covetousness. Why? Because not that you don't have enough, but because other people have more than you. And sometimes you look at even people that have less than you, like Ahab, and it's like, I want what that person has. But you, you have more than that person. So it's, 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 it's something that is really spoken against in the scripture. So begin to ask yourself, what are you converting? It's not just about money. Sometimes it, whatever God has not given you, maybe the other person has it. Don't convert it. Even in the, in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not convert. If your neighbor's wife is his, it's not yours. It's his. Take your eyes off. Or your neighbor's property, or your neighbor's car. Because she has that car, I must go and have that car. I must go and buy it equal. Why? Because uh, we're mates. So all that is covetousness. So what are the types of covetousness? Actually, there are two types. There's positive covetousness. So as you look at the Bible, it says, honestly covet the best gifts. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. So this is one of the few times when God is saying, I want you to convert. But what do I want you to convert? The best gifts. So how do you apply it? That word convert is there. It means almost like envy. It actually means envy. The word interpreted here, convert, in this place. It means you see the other person. The person has gift. The person has whatever gift it is, it could be gift of faith or gift of prophecy. You are not jealous and saying that that person, uh, I want something bad to happen to them because they, they have something that, mm. it's like God. I see this, the way this person has the gift of uh, faith or the gift of uh, working of a miracle or this one. God, I want gift also, give me gift. Not so that I can be, compare myself, but I also want to be profitable in the kingdom of God. So convert earnestly the best gifts. And yet I will show you a more excellent way, which is the way of love. He said, wherefore, brethren, convert to prophesy. So you see other people prophesy, they're saying, God, help me also. I want to prophesy. I want to have that gift of prophecy. Convert to prophecy, and I prophesy, and forbid not to speak in tongues. And follow after charity, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. The word dead desire is the same word that is used for convert, you know, in the Greek. So it means, which means, it, it means that, you know, convert spiritual gifts, convert spiritual gifts. Desire, so instead of having this uh, desire to have possession, I need to have this, I need to, have, because the other person has it, you know, be, begin to desire, begin to convert spiritual things, spiritual qualities, spiritual productivity. You know, begin to desire more and more of it. If there's a hunger there, God will not say you are too hungry for spiritual gifts or you are too hungry for the power of God in your life or you're too hungry for, you know, the ability to serve. No. So this is positive covetousness. But most of the time, you have other covetousness. You have this negative covetousness. So in let's go through these uh, references. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Which is telling us something. Colossians chapter 3. 
Colossians chapter 3. Verse 5, it says, Mortify therefore your members which are on the earth, fornication. Kill these things in your body. Kill them. Fornication, uncleanness, uncleanliness, or the inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Out of all these things, the only thing that God calls idolatry is covetousness. God equates it with idol worship. He said, but I'm not worshipping idol. I'm not bowing down before this God that looks like elephant or God that looks like monkey or whatever. God says, you are bowing down for money. You've turned money, you've turned car, you've turned house, you've turned all these material things into a God. It's idolatry. And God says you're an idol worshipper. You, you worship gold, you worship silver, you worship pounds. Is, and what the solution is God says, kill it in your body, you know, mortify it there. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, as we move on, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, for this you know that no homemonger, no clean, clean person or covetous man who is an idolater has an, any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Anytime you see in the church, don't be deceived in any church. If you say covetous person, he say these people are the same as a homemonger. They're the same as an unclean person. They don't have any inheritance. The person might say, I'm speaking to us on my way to heaven. It's a lie. The person does not have any inheritance. His name is not written in heaven. So if the person is born again before and has yielded to covetousness, why? Because they're looking at other people. Why? Because they're listening to some certain messages that some preachers are preaching. As if, if you don't have this, you are nothing. Then your name has gone out. You don't have any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, we've already read before. So in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and verse 10. It says, but they that will be rich fall into a temptation and it's not. They that is their dream, is their first thought in the morning, is their last thought in the day. It governs them. If you give them money, they can sell their mother, their grandmother to you. They can sell anything, they can do anything, they can walk out from their family and go and find jobs somewhere and say, You people be taking care of yourself here. I'm going after pounds. You see, they that will be rich by all means. They that say, Because my brother had. Ah, that brother, is he not in, was I not here when he came into this country, in this church? Now he has business. Me also, I must have. Then I will be rich by all means. What happens? They fall into temptation and into a snare. There are traps that the devil has set for them. And into many foolish and hopeful which drive men in Destruction and perdition. I pray you will not draw in destruction and perdition in Jesus' name. For the love of money is the root of all evil. We cannot be wiser than the Bible. If the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, then that is true. The love of money is the root of all evil. Which, while some coveted after they have heard from the faith, they were in the faith before, and they have passed themselves through with many sorrows. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 20. Matthew chapter 6, verse 20. From verse 19. Lead not for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, or where thieves break in through and steal, but lay for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break in nor steal. That's what we said earlier in the summary of the certain scripture. If your treasure is in heaven, your heart will be there also. Lay your treasures in heaven. So if somebody is Ahab wants to even come, God forbid that Ahab should come and say, this house, I'll kill you for if, if you don't leave this house for me. And it's your house. You say, Ahab, I have treasures in heaven. You know, I will fight you in the court of law. But if it's a matter that you are saying you want to kill me on this thing, you know, if you want to take my coat, take it. 
God, God will give me another better one. Amen. So these are what we, this is covetousness as we hear about it. So some facts about covetousness, it comes from the hearts. I'll just run through this because of our time. Covetous, if you read Mark chapter seven, it says, out of the heart comes covetousness. It engrosses the heart, it fills the heart. So it's not just that it comes from the heart. When, when there's covetousness, it will fill the heart. That is what will be driving all the thought and all the decision making. You can write down the references. Is idolatry, we've read that one. Is the root of all evil, we've read that one. It's never satisfied. Let us see Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. Covetous says, you say, ah, you know, there are some people that they say, let me give church a break now. I need to buy a house. When this, look at our age. This house we must buy. If we don't buy, now when are we going to buy? We came, we didn't come early. So we have to, we have to run ahead and we have to make sure that we catch up. So they, 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 they do some things. Or well, sometimes it's not even. Sometimes they even have. They say I must have better. Because why? Because the other person is competition now. But you see what you say about covetous? It's never satisfied. If you say I will take a break from this, I will do this one. Covetousness is. In fact, the more the more that people have, the more they want. Some of the most contented people on earth are poor, are poor people. They just they're just happy. They eat their vegetable. They drink water, and they don't have any high blood pressure. They just sleep. Nobody, nobody's making them afraid. Some of the most contented people, are, they have less. But some of the people that are less content, they have more. Because they have tasted it, they want more and more of it. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. It says, he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. It's in the scripture. No, he that loveth increase, not he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they are increased at each step. Money attracts a lot of causes you never knew you had before. You know, second cousin, third cousin, they will find you out. <laughs> With the one you never had before, they will be calling uncle, uh, auntie, my auntie, and uh, this or that. People that never knew you for, you've been here for 20 years. <laughs> you see, when goods increase, they are increased at each time. And what good is there to be the owners of saving, beholding them with their eyes? This is wisdom that, you know, gets to a point like Solomon says that, you know, the money comes in, it goes out. And the only thing is you just see the money coming into the account, it's going. I pray our own will not be like that in Jesus' name. It's never satisfied and it's vanity. You can write that down. It's vanity. So, now we will move on briefly. We'll just talk about the cure. What is the cure to all this? We've touched on some of the cure. To this in uh, Colossians chapter three, verse five, it says, kill it. Kill, kill the, um, kill the, mortify it in your body. If it's in your heart, you tell your heart, heart be at rest. That's what Ahab should have done. He should have told his heart, heart, you know, be at rest. Remind himself that, look, I have house. I have garden at the back of my house. You know, it, I like, it's wanting to like neighbor's vineyard. It's, that's not wrong. Oh, I like this vineyard. I like the way the man is taking care of it. You know, and you say, you even tell him that, look, vineyard, your, your neighbor's your vineyard looks very nice. I like it. We say, thank you, sir. But it's another thing to desire it as your own. It's wanting to look at somebody's children or somebody's wife. Or, I, I, since I like your husband, your husband looks very you know, you have to be very kind, very nice. Your children are very obedient. It's another thing to desire. That, that, uh, I wish that that thing was mine. That is another level. Praise the Lord. And, and maybe taking actions to make it yours. So what is the cure to these things? Um, in um, First Peter chapter 6, First Peter chapter 6, from verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen. You have godliness, put your hand up. I have godliness. You add on contentment with it. It's great gain. Amen. Why? Because some people look at it in verse 5. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, 
supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself they say gain is godliness but that is not good that's not correct some people today they say the same thing gain is godliness they say gain a sign that god is with you is that you are you are you are getting richer but they say that is not right godliness with contentment is great gain so the lord will help us in jesus name so the lord will the Lord will help us, and uh, because I promise to give you a reference. Let's see in Second Kings chapter nine, verse twenty-six. Before we pray, Second Kings chapter nine, verse twenty-six. Just going back to Naboth and uh, seeing the extent, probably, of what happened. Second Kings chapter nine, verse twenty-six. I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons. Not just Naboth. I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, said the Lord. And I will cry, I will requit thee in this plot, said the Lord. Now therefore take and cast him into the plot of ground according to the word of the Lord. That's it, the blood of Naboth, not just the blood of Naboth, the blood of his sons as well. Let's say this to the Lord in prayer. Where we started from is a, is a life without covetousness. Is it possible? That's what God said. He said, let your, um, let your lifestyle be without covetousness. Let your conversation be without covetousness. A life without covetousness is a life of peace. Let's rise up on our feet, please. And pray, life without covetousness is a life of peace. It's a life of peace. Some people become covetous since they are in debt now. They cannot sleep. They earn money, they are paying money. A lot of why? Well, they said, I must have this by force. I must have that by force. What well, you cannot afford. Don't go and dip your hand into it by because of covetous. It's the type of house. And this is the type of house my cousins in America, this is the type of house they have. When they send picture home, this is the type. So me, I must also go and have one kind of house. So when I'm sending the picture home, they will say, he's a successful man, he's a successful woman. Don't give yourself high blood pressure because of covetousness. You know, the country we live in, some people, fancy, fancy, car, you know, car that is, the amount is just so, and they go and buy it brand new. I say, but how much are you earning? They cannot afford it. But they say, I must have this thing, do or die. Why? Because somebody else have it. Not because the car is performing better. So because somebody else have it, I must have it, do or die. It's covetousness. It's covetousness. Some other people, Learn to be contented with yourself. Young people learn to be contented with your, what God has given you. What has he given you? He's given you your body. He's given you your height. He's given you your eye color, your hair color. Be contented with it. You don't say, well, the other person, oh, look at my friends. They are taller. They are skinnier. They are whatever. Me also, I must be skinny. I must be tall. Why? Because be contented with, God has not made you a skinny person. So don't be, be contented with what you have. Be contented with what you have. Contentment does not mean that you do not try to improve yourself. If you try to improve yourself, you work hard, but it's not out of covetousness because the other person have it, I must have it. And then what belongs to somebody else? Don't put your eyes on it like neighbors. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, you have told us today that you reminded us that we should live a life without covetousness. We've seen Ahab, just the simple, not being able to control his desire to have Nebot's vineyard. It resulted in the death of this man. Lord, we're praying, we'll be able to control our desire. When we see something in the shop, if it's something that we cannot afford, We'll be able to control this. We'll be able to mortify that convention, kill it. And say, well, I like this thing, but I cannot afford it. So it's not going to happen. Forget it. We'll not be go and get into debt in order to have things just to try and meet up 
with what people expect us to be in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. We pray that you will enrich us truly, but our minds will not be on that riches and our hearts will not be there. and will not be people that are rich and yet are covetous for more in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's share the grace, please. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Don't